All right, well, good evening, folks. Listen, I wonder if you could all do me a little kindness. I wonder if you could maybe come and sit in the first or the second row if you're sitting, if you're standing. Maybe if you could come a little bit closer for a little bit of figurative and a little bit of literal warmth. I'd like to uh, thank Josh Bailey for organizing this event. I think Josh has done a very beautiful job of bringing together some musicians and some speakers for this really important gathering. I also want to thank Bruce Williams for doing the sound here, the musicians, and the other speakers. So now, I want to begin in a peculiar way in a place and time that you might not expect. I want to go to ancient Greece, to 400 years before the life and times of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm sure you've all heard something at some point in your lives about a man named Socrates. You probably know that Socrates was a philosopher. Socrates was also one of the first known and most widely known political prisoners. Imprisoned and executed as an enemy of the state. Now, whether or not one agrees with his arguments today, and I can't say that I myself do, I want to share an image of Socrates the subversive. Some portray Socrates as a philosopher who had no idea about the subversive nature of his life's work. Not until after he was arrested for it, they say. That's when he found out how subversive he was. But what did Socrates do? Socrates did philosophy in the streets. He did philosophy with slaves with those who were deemed at the time incapable of thinking. And he did it in order to show that they could indeed think and that they could think very well. Socrates also opposed all those early academics who wanted to do philosophy as a trade, who wanted to exchange ideas for money, to teach the sons of rich men how to win arguments with the art of rhetoric in order to win political power. Now, Socrates always professed his love for Athens. Yet whenever he spoke in public, the reflections and the recommendations he made stood in direct contrast to the state of Athenian politics and society. It is actually hard for me to accept that Socrates didn't know the subversive work he was doing. He must have known the risks associated with his life activities. Perhaps he was cautiously playing with subversion, testing the limits of political discourse in the existing society. But Socrates never spoke from the perspective of the state. He always, he always and openly questioned the widespread consensus that might makes right. And he was found guilty on two counts. First, corrupting the minds of the youth of Athens. And second, impiety. What impiety means is not believing in the gods of the state. What it meant to corrupt the minds of the youth was essentially to get them thinking against the official positions of state power, to get young people thinking against existing society, beyond any endorsement of what is, and to get young people thinking instead about what ought to be the case in the world for these beautiful crimes, for this subversive life activity, for a criminality that should be an inspiration to all philosophy, to all of us. Socrates was placed in prison and sentenced to death. 
Now, when I teach Socrates and Plato at the university, students often express their gratitude that we no longer live in societies where people are thrown into jails and prison for expressing ideas that condemn, that criticize, and that throw into question the existing state of affairs. Many students, and certainly not all, think that these things only happened a long time ago. So let me jump far ahead. Let me jump to Italy in the 1960s and 1970s to another great philosopher, one of the greatest of the present era. One who is still alive today, Antonio Negri. In March of 1978, Aldo Moro, the former Italian prime minister, was kidnapped in Rome. He was kidnapped in Rome by an armed revolutionary group called the Red Brigades. Moro was murdered. His body dumped into a city street. The great autonomous Marxist philosopher Antonio Negri was falsely associated with the kidnapping and the murder of Moro. He was falsely associated with the Red Brigades. Negri was, in fact, part of a very different movement in Italy known as Autonomia and was later exonerated from Moro's kidnapping and murder. One of the charges, one of the charges against Antonio Negri was, quote, armed insurrection against the state. He was accused of this largely because of the influence of his revolutionary writing in Italy, prominent during the decade of uprisings in that country from 1968 to 1979. Antonio Negri, for writing incendiary ideas, for writing revolutionary things that inspired a movement, he was sentenced to 30 years for being an instigator among other things. In 1979, when Negri appeared before his judges, he was accused for writing the philosophy that was acted out in the streets. Although it was untrue that he was associated with the kidnapping and murder of Moro, that he was associated with the Red Brigades, and despite his exoneration, keep this in mind, folks, Antonio Negri was not finally freed until the spring of 2003. Another great philosopher, Michel Foucault, asked about Negri while he was in prison, quote, isn't he in jail simply for being an intellectual? Foucault's point was that Negri was essentially guilty for the crime of thinking against the currents of power, indeed quite like Socrates. Now, when such things happen today, Common sense, especially in the United States, says that, well, they don't happen here. I mean, he's giving us examples from so long ago in Greece, in Italy. These things happen in other countries today, like Russia, like in the case of the feminist protest punk group Pussy Riot, which formed in Moscow in 2011. Like Socrates and Negri, Pussy Riot engaged in the politics of subversion. They staged uninvited performances in unauthorized locations, such as cathedrals, on top of buses, on scaffolds in the Moscow metro. What a beautiful thing that would be if every band with a political message took such an approach. What a beautiful thing that would be. In February of 2012, the group did an illegal performance in Moscow's Cathedral of Christ the Savior. Very disrespectful. Now, two of the group members, Nadezda Tolokonikova and Maria Alyokina, were arrested and charged with, okay, how does this sound? They were arrested and charged with hooliganism. A third member, Yekaterina Samutsevich, was arrested as well. And just in case you were about to rest assured that arcane charges like impiety are a thing of the past, you should know that, well, hooliganism is still a crime in some places. These creative and critical women were charged with, this is the actual charge, premeditated hooliganism. I wonder if there's any other kind. Performed by an organized group of people motivated by, quote, religious hatred or hostility. I wonder if this would be Socrates' charge today because it does sound a bit like impiety to me. 
Now, you might wonder why I've taken some time to speak of these cases at an event for Bradley Manning. So let me be clear. I believe the efforts to free Manning must be supported in every possible way. This young person's personal freedom and very life are at stake. Manning should not be in a prison while the architects of murder and torture that, it, that he exposed are regarded as upstanding citizens without a second thought. When it comes to the cause for Manning, the liberals in this country are no better than the conservatives like Obama and his administration, who express no real feeling for truth or for justice. In this case, which is why, Ob why Obama falls back on the ridiculous retort that Manning, quote, broke the law, an absurd contradiction for a government with an uninterrupted history of breaking the law at its own convenience. But the reason I mention these other cases is because I want to say something else. Of course, we must bring attention to Manning's case in the interest of freeing him. But we also must consider the freedom of political prisoners everywhere. And understand that this is not about individual heroes, but about a politics of repression that has a long global history. Also, I speak of these other cases because I see Manning within the same context and trajectory as I see Socrates and Tony Negri. And because I think that philosophers often don't look much like philosophers at all. Sometimes they look like a punk band in Moscow. Acts of civil disobedience, including the acts of Pussy Riot, eventually end up being regarded as noble acts, even as great acts, but only long after they're done. When acts of civil disobedience are taking place, that is when they are vilified. We should keep that in mind. And on the question of legality, it is important to remember that civil disobedience is always illegal by definition and that the law does not always embody and reflect what is right. There is a long history of unjust laws, and in their face, a long history of noble acts of defiance. I also want to say something else about the politics of subversion. The politics of subversion is the other side of a politics of repression. Manning is accused of a number of offensive offenses. But behind the screen of their good names, they all end up looking a lot like impiety to me. What is Manning accused of giving us? Giving us the material included in videos of a 2007 Baghdad airstrike that is the famous collateral murder video. A 2009 airstrike in Afghanistan. Manning is accused of having released hundreds of thousands of US diplomatic cables and army reports that came to be known as the Iraq and Afghan war logs. Manning is also thought by some to have been the source of the Guantanamo Bay Files leak. And it's been the videos that have had the greatest international public resonance, and perhaps for obvious reasons. Manning was first held in July 2010 by the US Marine Corps in Quantico, Virginia. Later, the Pentagon transferred him to Fort Leavenworth. He has suffered in solitary confinement. He has lived in a cell that was six by 12 feet with no windows. He has been classified as a suicide risk. The conditions of his detention 
have prompted national and international concern. And the news from inside about Manning's own condition has been disheartening and infuriating. One of the biggest differences between Manning's efforts and those of Socrates, Negri, and Pussy Riot is that the content of Manning's communiques has not been taken as seriously as they deserve to be taken. People, and this is surprising, I think, including many of Manning's defenders, tend to jump right over what he revealed to the question of whether or not he should be punished or exonerated. But I want to ask, what about the part in the middle? The part that mattered so much to Manning? What about the killing of civilians, of mothers and fathers, the shooting of children? What about torture, among other things? Manning himself described the information he had as, quote, explaining how the first world exploits the third in detail from an internal perspective, close quote. Now, shouldn't we want to know about that? Countless people read Plato's Socratic dialogues, and they read Negri. And countless, and we know, we know this to be sure, that Pussy Riot will have little difficulty selling records. The ideas and arguments that come into the world through subversive acts always survive longer than their authors do. But Manning wanted us to know something now. And we should be talking about that, too. Instead, what I have found are countless videos and articles interested in assessing Manning's psychological state. Some of these even appear sympathetic to Manning, but they all want to know, was he stable? What about his depression, his disaffection? Why, oh why, would Manning do this? Something must be wrong with him. I mean, this is frontline, you know, pretty sort of, I don't know, what, what is frontline? I don't even want to think about that right now. But, you know, why would he do this? Something must be wrong with him. Maybe it's his, this is always a subtext. Maybe it's his sexuality. Maybe it's his transgender aspirations. Well, I'm sorry, but those questions should be turned on their heads, entirely flipped over. We should be demanding to know about the psychological state of people who do not want to know what is really happening. What kind of situation do we have when the one who tells us what is happening, when the one who reveals the lies that are used to rationalize the massive carnage of war, when that one, when that one is looked upon as a psychological puzzle, while all the others who have no interest in knowing what is true are looked upon as perfectly sane. I do not want to know what is wrong with Manning. I want to know what is wrong with us. Manning famously wrote, if you saw incredible things, awful things, things that belonged in the public domain, what would you do? Well, we ought to ask Manning's question in the face of disinterest in the awful things that governments do everywhere. That is the question Manning asked. Manning was interested in the subversive nature of the truth. He was interested in the transformative power of a discourse capable of throwing the world as we know it into question. Manning was interested in dangerous ideas. As a philosopher myself, I have profound, deep respect for that. 
the law does not deserve the same respect as the truth. We also should remember that even though Socrates was condemned by a jury in his own time, and Socrates was widely thought to be guilty, there were also those who opposed the injustice of his situation, including friends, including friends who plotted to break Socrates out of prison. So there was another side, alive and well, opposed to the side that condemned Socrates. It is important that such a side is still here now, right here in this park for Bradley Manning. Manning is still alive, and like Socrates, has already secured a certain kind of immortality by way of his beautiful crimes. Manning has been a living force for the politics of subversion, and yet, for other reasons, as an end in himself, Manning has other things to do with his life beyond these acts of subversion. For all of these reasons, I say, free Bradley Manning! Thank you.